Hey, what's up, fellow The uh, title of this video will be why I don't live in the uh, Republic of Panama anymore. I don't know if I've ever told any of you guys about this. It's a little bit later in the day, and I have forgotten we had spring forward, so it's about 9-ish. You can see all of the trees are blooming back there. So I'm going to sit down here a little bit in the shade and tell you why. Uh, there's a lot of guys who they call themselves the Passport Bros, and... By me saying this, I'm going to simply explain what happened to me. Am I telling you not to go, not to do it, not to go over there and enjoy all the things that you may not be able to enjoy here? But I will tell you this cautionary tale. Now, I was uh, medically discharged from the United States Army in 2003, actually. April Fool's Day, no, the last day of March, last day of March in 2003. Um, prior to that, in uh, it started around 1998, I had figured out financially that I could retire early and live very well in Central and South America. Uh, and my wife at that time was from the small city in Chepo, Panama which we bought a lot of property in a place called Rio de Lomo, which is pretty much the uh, Lomo is the, the, the bulls they have down there, a big old fat piece on the back of their neck, and that's the Lomo. Anyways, all that to say this. So we started buying up land, and uh, we ended up building a, a farm there. Uh, we had cattle, chicken, goats, chivos. Uh, we had avocado trees, we had mango trees, we had yame and yucca, we, we grew pineapples, but they take like two years to mature. Anyways, it's wild, this huge plant at the bottom that goes like this, and this is one stem of <laughs> pineapple sitting on. Anyway, so, and uh, I was the only white guy there for probably at least an hour to an hour and a half in any direction and they all knew me and nobody would call me by my name they called me gringo and that's the word they use in central and south america is gringo they don't use the word here in uh in and around the border with mexico and that they use the word huero, uh, which starts actually with a g anyways so um, let me get to the point get to the point uh, I, if you choose to live in some place where you're not part of the community or you're an, a, a serious in a serious minority group, which I was one <laughs> of thousands living in that area, you experience a lot of things where people don't like you. And if you don't know, a while back before that, we had an operation down there called, called Just Cause, where we removed... Noriega, because uh, we decided he was a bad guy. He was, uh, anyways, we knew he was a narco. Anyway, just, let's just move on. So we're doing well. we got a couple of guys working for us. Uh, as a reward for them being honest with us and, and good with us, we would move their entire families onto the property that we had, and they would set up their own homes. Uh, it was it was just a great, we lived up on the side of the hill. We had a pool. I could show you the uh, aerial view of it. Anyways, goes on and on and on. And um, the family my uh, ex-wife belonged to uh, ran the small city of Chepo called the Jimenez family. And the big Don of the family, his name was Bosco. So Don Bosco was his name. He had, uh, I think, three three sons. One of them, I remember, Kikito. Anyways, doesn't matter. Let's just move on. So we're get going along there, and, and I, I really didn't have many, many problems other than people stealing and that kind of stuff. But uh, around 2012, and I'm telling you, I have sunk just about any tax return money we got. We'd go buy down. We just Everything was set up. We had our own power, we had our water. We had everything, all the food we could eat and all that kind of stuff. So... <clears throat> Around 2012, um, the party that my wife's ex-wife's family uh, lost, and, and down there in Central and South America, if your political party loses, everybody loses their job. They, 
one day you have a job, the next day you're out on your ass till the next elections. And they end up doing taxi cabs and driving buses and waiting tables and doing all kinds of stuff like that. But you go from like a high level government official to driving a taxi. All right. So they were very unhappy about that. What I didn't know is there were a lot of people who had an axe to grind with uh, that family, their people, as well as uh, I didn't realize how many narcos were using that area. Man, he doesn't. Let me just. I was just naive and stupid. So, all that to say this. In 2013, just things just getting crazy. And I believe in July of 2013, there was a uh, Gold Cup. CONCACAF was the big thing down there. And soccer was a huge thing. And I believe the U.S. men's national team beat Panama in a game in about, I don't know. Midnight, 11, 11 30, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the night, there's this massive group of like five or 600 people, guys, and they got, they literally got torches and their Molotov cocktails, and they uh, burned most of the farm down and burned my home down. And uh, so, in the meantime, when all of this is starting and they're, they're setting fires all over the uh, farm, um, I call the police and they laugh and hang up on me. I call the firefighter, firefighters, the bomberos. Uh, that's the name you use, bomberos. And I, uh, por favor, ayudarme. Uh, yo necesito ustedes voy ayudarme. And they laugh and hang up on me. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? They they had no intention. I, you're on your own. You're on your fucking own down there. And I should have known that. Again, I'm just telling you what happened to me. And oh yeah, by the way, I have my lifelong visa. To go to the country and live in the country of Panama. Anyways, it's called a jubilar visa. It means I'm retired, retired visa. I had to invest some money. Hey, did you want to get on with the fucking point? So now I'm freaking out. And they are, they're beating up everybody. And they're running the people off. And they're stealing the go. They're just doing everything and anything they can. And uh, I can't own a gun in Panama. Because I'm a foreign citizen. I cannot even, I need a permit to buy a pellet gun. That's a, the that's a truth. Now, they are running around. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Anyway, anyways. And I'm, I'm looking out, and I'm looking at people who I've known for like 10 years, and they're, they got hate in their eyes. They, anyways, doesn't matter. So I call the U.S. Embassy, and I'm like, hey, uh, shit's getting sideways. I need some help. Can you guys send a car to come get me? I said, no, you have to make your way to the U.S. Embassy. We cannot send a car out to get you. Pretty much I'm not fucking important enough. That's the same shit that will happen to any of you when you leave the United States. I would like to point this out. It is very rare outside the United States and the developed countries of the world to be able to call the police and not have them be a part of the bad guys. To be able to call the fire department, call for an ambulance, and they arrive in a timely manner. And they arrive with some what, some type of objectivity in them. I'm telling you, good luck to you if you want to go over there and you want to be a passport for on that, but um, got thrown in jail, they beat the shit out of you uh, anyways. It's their chance to get a little payback on not only a white guy, but an American. And uh, that, that was crazy. So, uh, I think if you want to go over there and you live, I think you should have a cheat sheet with all the phone numbers that you need to call. I think you should be honest and go and sit down with the consulate or the embassy and ask them, what exactly they can and can't do for you, what your rights are if you get arrested. What if a cop just doesn't fucking like the way you look or something like that, and you end up with drugs on you? What are you going to do? Do you have the money? Do you have the know-how to get in and out of their legal system? I'm just... It's a different world. It's not all rainbows and bunnies. I probably... And I gave all of that, uh, the farm and all the rest of the stuff that's like the cars, the, yeah, all, all the stuff, the plants, the, the 
trees. And, uh, I gave that to my uh, ex-wife when I left. So I come back in 2000, late 2000, I come back in 2013 and I stay around there. And in 2015, I find out that my sons that I helped to raise and provide for weren't mine biologically. And that's when I decided to leave my, my wife, move here to El Paso, uh, find a good traditional woman, and uh, got married to her. But we have a videotaped prenuptial agreement. She has to pay half of the bills. Uh, half of the bills. And whatever our bills are, she has to pay half of them. It's videotaped in front of her attorney and my attorney where you sit down and you have to say, do I understand this? It's written in Spanish and English so nobody can say they didn't understand the writing. All the little things that you think can get a, uh, a prenup thrown out, uh, in my opinion, don't apply. Uh, I've never had to exercise it, but it's uh, it was well worth the money spent. So, Good luck to you if you decide to go over to the United States. But I think you should make yourself aware of the amount of corruption. How thing, There are things that the country is going to tell you, Thailand, uh, Colombia, Mexico. They're going to tell you things uh, that you want to hear <laughs> about how their country works. And there's a difference between that and the practical realities of life. Okay? Love you guys. Stay safe and healthy. Take care of each other if you can. And if you can't, you got to take care of yourselves. Far more important than anybody wants you to believe. So that's when I talk to you about living different lives. I lived life as a criminal. I lived life as a soldier. I lived life as a disabled person. Uh, I lived life outside of the United States and tried to retire in the Chapel uh, area, Rio del Loma. And, uh, yeah. Came back to the United States, found out that I had to get divorced from my wife, moved, didn't know anybody from, I didn't know anybody from from El Paso. Never been here before in my life, was never stationed here. The only reason I moved here is I did a Google search in 2016 and found out that it was three and a half women to each man. And I figured that'd give me a good chance and I speak pretty decent Spanish. So I moved here, but I was over 300 plus dates. I was brutal about shopping. Fit feminine, uh, sign prenup, you have to pay half, you have to have a job, you have to have your own money. You're not coming in here and being independent to me, I've already been through that. So, yeah. And that's another life I'm leading now, like my fourth or fifth life in uh, live, live, life in my uh, lifetime so far. And this is probably the best I've ever been treated, or, but I, I still don't go a lot to, to Mexico because I don't speak a fifth gear Spanish and I don't want to there's there's cartels down right across the border from us that are warring anyways like a fort in a g-string from west Texas El Paso just be careful uh, there are a lot of advantages to finding a woman outside the United States I did it myself um, but you have to understand the disadvantages and that the people there may not like you, all right? No matter what you do. Bye-bye.